Welcome, welcome uh, I'm, to all of you here in person. Uh, my name is Ty Sidgley. I'm the executive director of the Common Ground Program and would like to welcome you here today. This is our third Common Ground Program this semester. And tonight we are excited to host our first event with our partner, the Bipartisan Policy Center a Washington-based not-for-profit organization that ensures policymakers work across party lines to craft bipartisan solutions. Hamilton College and the University of Tennessee Knoxville are the only two higher ed institutions who have signed partnerships with BPC. Our partnership includes two events a semester, uh, which I'll talk about the second one here in a minute, and an internship program in the District of Columbia. BPC says that bipartisanship is not about abandoning your party, Likewise, Common Ground does not try to change your position on an issue. Instead, we want to bring people together to learn about complex issues and highlight differences in a civil way. Our mission is to explore cross-boundary political thought and complex social issues. Common Ground brings together highly respected thought leaders like we have tonight to the Hamilton campus to participate in small classroom dialogues and large event discussions. Topics intertwine with the college's curriculum, are chosen to foster critical thinking, holistic examination of difficult and often contentious national and global issues. And that's our goal tonight. I want to thank a few people before we start. Uh, President Whitman uh, has, has given us the resources necessary to do this. The Common Ground team, uh, Katie Stewart and Kim Ritchie did all the work. And the BPC team, Andrew Nason, John Richter, and Steve Scully. Thanks. And I also want to recognize our uh, Common Ground student assistants. The college is grateful to Mary Helen and Robert Morris, class of 76 and parents of 16 and 17, Eve Niquette and Charles Pohl, class uh, parents of 20 and 25, and Lori and David Hess, class of 77. Their support is indispensable for what we do. A reminder about our final two events this semester. On November 6th, that's Monday, we will host an, an event uh, called an Energy Transition Pathway featuring two former directors of the Environmental Protection Agency, Gina McCarthy and Christine Todd Whitman here in the chapel, and that will be moderated by our own Aaron Strong. Finally, December 4th, Common Ground and the Bipartisan Policy Center will host two former members of Congress, uh, Congresswoman in Florida and, and uh, Florida Senate candidate Val Demings, who is on President Biden's shortlist for the vice presidential nomination, and former Senator Roy Blunt, Republican from Missouri. Steve Scully from the BPC will bring his Sirius XM show on POTUS Network, POTUS Channel, here to campus. Now it's my honor to introduce our moderator who will then introduce our guest. Uh, Leslie Jantarasamy is the Managing Director of the Bipartisan Policy Center's Energy Program and leads their research and policy efforts on sectorial decarbonization strategies and standards, including focused areas on natural climate solutions, voluntary carbon markets, and clean electricity policy. She brings over 12 years of climate policy experience at the state and federal levels, having previously worked at the Oregon Department of Energy on climate initiatives and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency on greenhouse gas regulations in the transportation and power sectors. She has a Master of Science and Master of Public Administration degrees from the University of Washington School of Environmental and Forest Sciences and the Evans School of Public Policy and Governance. And her bachelor's degree is from Duke University. Please join me in welcoming Leslie and our panel to Hamilton. joining us today. We're very excited to have this conversation and I'm thrilled to be emceeing tonight. But here I am, first off, going to kick off with some introductions. So this is George David Banks, better known as Dave Banks. He's an economist, Republican, political analyst, and policy advocate focused on climate change, energy, and trade. Works as a fellow at the Bipartisan Policy Center and a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council and Citizens for Responsible Energy Solutions. And you have an extensive career in government, serving as President Donald Trump's Special Assistant for International Energy and Environment uh, at the National Economic and National Security Councils, and as President George W. Bush's Senior Advisor on International Affairs and Climate Change. And Dave holds a JD from George Mason University, an MA in Economics, and his Bachelor's Degrees from the University of Missouri at St. Louis. And 
Next, I'd like to welcome Jason Grimay. Jason is the Chief Executive Officer of the American Clean Power Association, also known as AEP, <coughs> the foremost trade association representing the clean energy industry. He's dedicated to working with APP's nearly 800 member companies to provide families and businesses with affordable, reliable energy made in the U.S. and powered by American workers. Uh, Jason founded and ran the BPC and as, as its president for 15 years and has led the bipartisan National Commission on Energy Policy and has been working uh, in this space for quite a while. So, Jason, you have JD from Harvard and you have <coughs> bachelor's from Brown University. He's fancy. That's yeah, all true. Exactly. <laughs> Is my mic on? So you all missed that beautiful introduction of, of me and Dave? Wow. It's tragic. It used to be on. There it is. You got it. Yeah. <clears throat> well, we're not going to rehash that. Um, you guys know that we bring some expertise in energy policy. We all work together in Washington, D.C., and so um, we're here, though, to bring this conversation to Hamilton. And what we really you know, are, are hoping to get out of this is some conversation about what it takes to actually transition to a clean energy future in the United States. There are different, you know, different perspectives on this. There are different people that have different ideas. Um, about how to get there, and so we're really trying to surface that tonight. And so I'm gonna get the conversation started with some questions, but we really, all three of us are really interested to hear from you as well. And so I invite you to be thinking of questions that you wanna ask as we chat for the next about you know, half an hour, and then around 8, 10, I'm gonna open it up for a Q&A and some discussion um, with this group. And then we'll wrap things up with some closing questions and takeaways from our speakers. So that's. That's what we're gonna to do tonight. So let's start out with some context setting. And so Dave, let's start with you first um, and really just lay out here from your perspective, what are we talking about with the US energy transition? What's the goal that we're really trying to, to do as a nation? And what are we trying to accomplish and why? Well, I think we're, if you're talking about what the US goal is, uh, we're really talking about two or three different objectives and Jason, weigh in if I forget one, but one would be uh, to address climate change and, and to further decarbonize the United States and, and uh, contribute its share uh, to the global uh, agenda. But then there's also an economic and energy security piece of this, right? Because um, again, you know, despite, despite uh, you know, the fact that the United States is producing more oil and gas than it has in a long time and exporting it, uh, we're still hostage to the global nature of the crude market and supply shock. So I would say that's hmm. in a really high level that for me, <clears throat> you know, as a Republican who cares a lot about climate, and let's just say I'm a climate activist, I look at the U.S. and think about what, what type of policy should the United States have with climate and energy and how should that be leveraged to get the uh, the emission reduction and avoidance results that we need globally, meaning primarily, you know, how can the U.S. leverage its position uh, to accelerate the deployment of low carbon technologies globally at the scale uh, that the science suggests? So that's kind of where I am when it comes to U.S. policy and kind of stepping back. And, you know, and that's where you have to really look at what the science says, uh, what, what's the global carbon budget, how many folks out there know what the global carbon budget is? So it's essentially, okay, okay, so it's essentially, and by the way, this is, this is important to know, uh, because if you're talking about addressing climate change, uh, it, you, and uh, if people throw around temperature targets, 1.5 degrees, 2 degrees, I'm sure you've all kind of seen that. What does it mean? Well, it essentially means that we have a global carbon budget that if we exceed that, Will it will exceed the 1.5 degree, and if we see it, or the two degree targets, and that's really global warming uh, increase above pre-industrial levels back to 1750. Not to get into a tremendous <laughs> amount of weeds, uh, but that's that's essentially what it is. And so, if you look at the global carbon budget, and if you're looking at the 1.5 degree target or the two degree targets, for 1.5 degree, it's very dismal. Right, so we have a global carbon budget left of, well, it's, it's slightly less than six years left with current emission trends that if we exceed that, we're gonna blow past 1.5. Uh, 
For two degrees, it's a little better, but still ex extremely challenging. It's about 23 years. So that, in my mind, should inform what type of climate policies we're talking about here in the United States and what kind of climate policies we need globally and how can we leverage U.S. climate energy policy to produce the results that we need. Okay, so I heard a couple things. So we're tying our U.S. energy transition to this broader <clears throat> context within the globe. We're interested in the climate aspect, the greenhouse gas emissions. We're also interested in the economics and the energy security pieces. So Jason, what do you say to that? What, what do you think from okay, your so perspective? So a couple of things. First of all, it's super fun to be here, having spent some time with John and others kind of nurturing this partnership, seeing it really come to life is important. And my suggestion to you is that it is the imagination of this kind of collaboration that is as important as any of the precise insights we are going to share with you. My second observation, um, and I will answer your question, is Leslie and I have had a chance to do this a bunch over the last 10 years. But this is the first time that we're doing it when she doesn't work for me. So I'm interested in seeing whether that changes a little bit of the um, precision of your questioning. Um, all right, entering this writ large, I'm going to take it to a little bit of a kind of what's been happening in the US. There's been a, and just also kind of lay out the kind of partisan kind of angle of the climate and energy debate, because it's probably one of the most kind of culture war partisan issues that the country is, and certainly in the top five. For 20 or 30 years, the environmental community imagined that the goal was to have a kind of a strict limit on the nation's emissions, they call it a carbon cap, and everybody would get a little piece of that and you could either reduce the emissions or buy credits from each other, um, or, Carbon tax. They tried to call it a carbon fee, but everybody knows it was a carbon tax. And a carbon tax just raises the price of energy based on how much carbon is embedded, right? So a solar you know, facility would have no carbon price and a coal facility would have a reasonably high carbon price. And that would then just force the process forward. That's where the progressives have been. The conservatives weren't so into that. Right? There was a you know, question about the scientific kind of integrity of this kind of climate modeling, um, but really it was just a question of more regulation, more taxation. And that fight spun with almost no progress for about 15 years, until about three years ago, when a couple of senators, Senators Murkowski from Alaska and Manchin, said, let's really dig in on this idea of technology innovation. Let's do what America does exceptionally, which is, you know, figure out what that next set of technologies are that can provide these benefits and actually be better for consumers and everybody else. So they passed a big law, which, you know, we were very involved in, laid out a lot of different goals. The only thing was it had no money. Congress passes laws to authorize, but if they don't appropriate that authorization, it was just kind of a show pony. Along comes President Biden makes a shocking commitment to a $10 trillion investment, um, which appropriately gets whittled down you know, to about a quarter of that. Um, but what it really is, the IRA is basically an energy infrastructure bill, and it provides significant funding to embrace what actually is now a core premise, which is an energy strategy that's based on innovation and investment. That's you know, the Democrats and Biden were the top priority pushing that approach forward. That's always been the approach that has resonated with Republicans. In addition, 80% of the investment coming out of the IRA is gonna land in districts that are currently governed by Republican members of Congress. Because renewable power needs a lot of space and it tends to happen in largely rural America. So you'd think, the Democrats supported this bill. It matches kind of an ideological premise that has always you know, kind of anchored a Republican ethos. The benefits are going to Republicans, but they hate it. And they hate it because of the way it was passed. And I'm coming to that conclusion and sharing that because that's what this session is about, right? Process matters. It was passed through a legislative process called reconciliation which allows one party to move with just 50 votes and then shut out the other party. And so Republicans were just literally shut out of that whole conversation. So even though the bill has a lot of the bones of what you know, Republicans and conservatives have long supported, the process was so alienating 
that there is an active desire among many conservatives to repeal this law. Much of what I spend my day doing is building the kind of robust infrastructure of support to prevent that from happening. But so that's kind of the, we are now at an innovation and investment moment, but there's no cap and there's no tax. And so the question is how fast will the innovation achieve the goals that Dave laid out? Okay, so lots of issues there. You've skipped ahead, Jason, and what I was thinking that we would talk about, but that's okay. So I have a habit of it. Yeah, I know. So Inflation Reduction Act is the IRA that we're talking about. This is a major law, historic amounts of money going towards clean energy. And so let's take a step back too, because you work for ACP, American Clean Power, but a lot of people have different perspectives on what is clean power and what, what are we talking about here? Because, and would love to hear your take on this too, Dave, because the, the question of clean power and what does the US energy you know, future look like to a lot of people, they wonder, well, well what's coming to, to my area? What kind of clean power do we need to be building more of? And so we'd be curious I'm, I'm to hear. I'm guessing you. Dave and I agree about this. Um, it's the impact on climate change. And you know, I have said too many times in the last 15 years that in the energy and climate debate, Republicans have been challenged by science and Democrats have been challenged by math. The goal of implementing this incredible transition is to address climate change. We are way behind and we should be supporting every technology that benefits that purpose with a realistic sense of how far it takes to get from here to there, right? 12% of the country is using renewable energy right now. 88% isn't, we've got a long way to go. But so nuclear power, absolutely. They're not our members, but I don't see how we get this done if we don't have the next generation of nuclear resources. Hydropower, absolutely. Using fossil fuels and then you know, sequestering the carbon in kind of underground places that don't let it bubble out, 100%. Like we're gonna, so when you get to the point of wanting to solve the problem, what I see the progressives do is then wanna solve it in a very special particular way. And we just don't have time for that, right? So I think that math requires clean equals low carbon. And, think about that. Yeah, I agree. And, and, and by the way, I think that the supply chain security piece of the IRA is really important. And that is, that's, that's one of the newer things that you see uh, with the IRA. And supply chain security policy is a relatively new policy area, okay? Uh, flowing largely from you know, what happened with COVID and the supply chain issues with uh, overlines with, Ch with Chinese uh, uh, producers, but then also with the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And I think that this was really, think of, correct me if, I, if, you, if, if you guys can think of something else, but this was like really the first step that Congress has taken to address a supply chain security piece. Now they didn't do it incredibly well, uh, but, I, but I will say, uh, and then by the way, just uh, a, a point that I often make with folks, if you're looking at innovative policy making in Washington, DC, it's very, there are very limited places where it happens, right? The White House, you don't have time because you're sitting there trying to put out fires and manage the government. So you have very little time to come up with innovative policy. The House, it's just not the place to, uh, to push innovative policy, in part because of the election cycles of two years. The Senate is where it is. You know, members are not as differential to committees and leadership structure. They got the six year election cycle so they can take risk, okay? Uh, but just because it's the, it's the better place to uh, innovate policy doesn't mean that policy is gonna be well informed, okay? And certainly, certainly reconciliation wasn't in, was incredibly well informed, um, in, at, at least in a number of parts. But look, I mean, with the, I think the supply chain security agenda is going to drive further decarbonization. And let me just pick up on that because it's a really important point, right? National security and energy policy has always been a question of how much oil we rely on. And as Dave said, the ability of other countries to weaponize that oil. One of the main reasons that we are promoting this clean energy transition is we're getting away from oil to free fuel that is right here in America. So that's a huge benefit. But guess what? The technologies to convert that free fuel into energy aren't made in the US. 
we're trying really hard to change that. But China has a choke point on a lot of parts of the solar. I mean, if China said, like, we no longer want to sell you know, components for solar energy to the US, our solar industry stops. This was an unfortunate choice that the Congress made 20 years ago when they decided that China should be a you know, permanent you know, PNTR kind of trade partner, normalization of trade. They did a really good job shifting a lot of stuff to China. We now want it back. We need to bring it back. Globalism at this moment, not such a great idea that is kind of rousing the hearts and minds of the country. It's gonna take a while to bring it back. So this piece of legislation has incentives for domestic factories and domestic investment to try to, in fact, not just get the clean energy, but get it so that we are not trading oil dependence for technology dependence. Thanks, Jason. I was going to ask, you know, when you say supply chain sustainability, you are referring to some of those policies within the Inflation Reduction Act that incentivize bringing that domestic back. Domestic content. Exactly. Right. Investments yeah. uh, domestic in domestic mm -hmm. manufacturing. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Definitely. And so I just have a question. So, so this is one of the kind of ancillary benefits, right, of saying, like, we're going to transition to clean energy. Or by doing that, we're going to be contributing to, you know, climate solutions. We are also going to be contributing to uh, revitalization of American manufacturing and, and jobs. Uh, what are some of the other benefits that you see the current energy system providing that you think need to be maintained as we transition to that clean energy future and the kind of the next generation of this system? What do you, what do you still want out of the current system? So that's a good question. And by the way, I would say to the to your point, maybe, maybe the IRA achieves these things, oh, right? Okay. And I and, and but this <laughs> but this it's linked to it's linked to, to what you said or the, your question is that and and I'm and Jason works a lot on this issue, permitting reform, right? If we don't have permitting and regulatory reform, we can't build this stuff, right? And so and that cuts across the supply chain, right? So it's not just it's not just uh, mines and Whatever, but it's also energy intensive manufacturing or or manufacturing that will produce the goods that we need to displace what we're what we're getting from China. But I also think, uh, and don't hate me here, because you know what I'm going to talk about now. Next, you know what I'm going to talk about. Don't don't go border tax yet. Don't do it. <laughs> but just in general, in general, you also so you need so and, and what I tell folks: look, you need permitting reform. You need subsidies, at the, and I think the IRA has, has, has checked that box, right? Especially subsidies for key strategic sectors of the economy. But then you also do need, to, do, to trade, do need a trade policy that protects those investments. Because we've seen what's happened in the past, right? We know China's playbook, right? We know exactly what they'll do, right? They will purposely uh, manipulate or yeah, I think that's right. Look for loopholes uh, within the current trade system uh, to be able to pursue predatory trade practices that help crush their competition. So we can Dave, spend. I want. I want to promise you we're going to go on trade. <laughs> I want to acknowledge like Dave is like the Don Quixote of this idea. Like ten years ago, <laughs> Dave Banks started talking about using trade policy, and like we all thought he was just kind of a pain in the ass, and no one was. He was. No one was paying him. No one was. Like, and now he, act, this is now one of the dominant ideas in the climate debate. So I promise, <laughs> I know we'll talk about it. Um, but Leslie, you asked the question about like, what is nice about the current energy system? So um, incandescent lighting, um, absent the current energy system, we are living in a world of you know, cold showers and warm beer. Right? Like, I'm super excited about the clean power industry. Like we are rocking it. We got the best technologies. It's the only way to achieve, the, like we will achieve these goals. But right now we're 12%, 12%. So do the math, 88% is the rest of the energy industry. And so when people talk about the clean energy transition, everyone wants to talk about where we're going. Net zero emissions by 2050, everyone's making promises. No one wants to talk about where we are and the incredible challenge of getting from here to there. And so that's what the current energy system is providing. And it's going to have to evolve. So, you know, we're not going to be done with pipelines. We may be done with natural gas pipelines, but we're going to have probably more pipelines moving carbon around and hydrogen around. And so it's going to be an energy industry 
that looks a lot like the companies running the current energy industry. And I will end with one disassociative point. About two thirds of the renewable power being built in the US right now is being built by companies that also have fossil fuel assets. They're also part of that 88% of the energy industry. So this like Luke Skywalker, Darth Vader, there are good companies and bad companies is just not the way the world works. The debate hasn't quite caught up with it yet. Um, but so the reality is we have these big companies with big balance sheets who know how to do big things, right? Climate change is a, it's a logistics problem. We need the biggest companies in the world fixing it. But that, is, that has not kind of sorted itself into the political space where you think, you know, conservatives like the existing sectors and you know, progressives want only the new. Um, yeah, and, yeah and, I, and, and I'll follow up on, on that really fast, if you don't mind, because I, I do think there is this mythology out there that Republicans hate renewables and love fossil fuels. Uh, because, look, I mean, clearly today, uh, you would not have the tax credit structure that we have, particularly when it comes to wind and solar, if you didn't have Republicans supporting it. Um, you know, and, and so, it, but to your point, right, the red states, red states benefit uh, from these policies. It's, you know, it gets, it gets kind of tangled up in the climate agenda, which then creates kind of a partisan divide on some of this stuff. But traditionally, up until pretty recently, EVs is another issue. Up until pretty recently, uh, EVs were, they weren't just cars. They were cars. Yeah. yeah. And Republicans, Kind of liked them. They, 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 I mean, they, there wasn't a whole lot of fighting over, uh, you know, having a tax credit and and looking at this from an energy security uh, point of view. Now they would they would debate on the maybe the amount of the tax credit and who the tax credit was going to, but EVs were pretty nonpartisan. The IRA, and again, this goes back to the process point. The way it was pulled together really drove a, a partisan line. Uh, along the EV, you know, around with EVs, and that's something that we're gonna to have to try to figure out how to, how to move forward. Yeah, and so I think, you know, to, to build on what you were all saying is, is that, you know, what, what I, the point I was trying to get at is that we're not sort of entirely remaking the U.S. energy sector that in a way that's going to look totally different than today's energy sector, <clears throat> and there are some things that we get benefits, right, in terms of energy reliability, affordability, and things that we kind of take for granted in terms of our everyday lives in, in energy, you know, that we want the, the clean energy system to also be providing. And so some of that bleeds over into the policy debate, yes, right, but, about cost effectiveness and reliability. And how do you see those things? Playing and also into? we need to think about this from a global energy security perspective, mm -hmm. right? Because the United States has trillions of dollars of economic assets and fossil fuels. So there's clearly an economic interest on the part of the US private sector, right, to invest in these low carbon technologies to address emissions from fossil fuels, just in case there is a carbon constrained world. And so I think that, I think that, uh, but, but this is to reinforce your point, in my mind with, if, if you're looking at US net zero in 2050, to your point, you know, you're, a lot of these fossil fuel companies are going to transition in addressing their emissions. Mm -hmm. And let's call you use the word reliability. So just for folks like that means the light staying on. Um, this has been a challenge, right? Like this has been the real issue. We've had these kind of mega storms that are broader than any region. Like I mean, a kid froze to death in the United States of America in Texas because we didn't have power. So the reliability issue is very real, um, and it has to be addressed. My personal view is that if we start pushing environmental policy that starts you know, undermining the reliability of our energy system, we're gonna slow down. Mm -hmm. I don't care how bad the climate is, mm -hmm. right? If it's the difference between like, there might be a giant flood in some other part of the world in the next you know, four months, or my refrigerator doesn't work, people are gonna focus on their refrigerator. So we have to make sure that these new technologies are seamlessly flowing into the existing system in that transition. We won't stop, but we, we will slow down if that becomes a real problem. Yes, and we lead the way in, in, uh, in producing, manufacturing, low carbon, affordable, reliable technologies that are exportable, right? 
that developing countries want to buy. Because developing countries, emerging economies, they don't have they don't have the resources to subsidize this kind of build out. So you have to you have to create a product that they're going to want uh, that also not only addresses emissions but also provides. You talk about reliability, economic and energy security. What is it? We have 800 million, almost 800 million people around the world who don't have access to electricity. I mean, and by the way, uh, just to shed some light on the definition of energy access, I mean, I think that we have a, we're so accustomed to having so much energy uh, that we don't even know what the numbers are, right? And so I think, what is it? You propose those. What's the average annual? Household consumption is like I'm, 10, I'm, not, I'm not a numbers guy. So I, I have no idea. Okay. So it's like it's I want to say it's like 10,000 kilowatt hours for the average American. So do you know so in the developing world, do you know how the how the IEA defines energy access? That the that a household, an urban household has access to 500 kilowatt hours. I can do 120th. I could do that. <laughs> and then you ask your, you know, and well, I mean, look, I mean it's I mean we have we have to we have to we have to construct again, construct a policy moving forward that also is thinking about how do you provide clean, affordable, reliable energy access to all those millions and millions and millions of people in a way that checks those boxes, including quality of life. Yeah, I, mean, I think we're not gonna solve the problem through deprivation. It's a collective action problem and that just doesn't work. We are not gonna convince the developing world to say like, Hey, the U.S. used all the carbon space, so you guys got to like stick with inadequate, you know, economics. So it's got to. We can be way more efficient. I mean, we are not in any way recognizing the you know opportunities to use energy, less energy to get the same things done. Um, and we can come up with technologies that people want. The only other thing that you all got to watch out for um, is electricity demand's been pretty flat for the last almost decade right that's kind of like everyone's been working within the assumption that like you know it's kind of flat and so if you put clean power in you're pushing something else out and that's actually kind of a good thing from the climate standpoint so this wacky ai thing that i don't understand at all <laughs> apparently is going to use like an insane amount of power mm -hmm. you know i mean elon musk who is of course nuts asserted that um it will increase the U.S. power grid by 11 times, which is just like showing off. He should have said 10, but he wanted to pretend he knew, so he said 11. Uh -huh. But even if it doubles, you know, so the we, so we're just to make the problem even more fun, we have to reduce the carbon while the amount we use is probably going up by a lot. And it's your chat. Beat. If you guys just keep using Chat GPT, just know you're screwing up the climate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so Jason, you mentioned earlier there's this innovation and investment agenda, right? We're using a lot of federal government dollars to incentivize behavior change, to drive investment decisions towards new technologies, right? So where then is the role for regulation? Mm -hmm. let's, let's throw that out there. Where, can you just lay out for both of you, where, where's the debate currently on regulating and putting some certainty around our emissions reduction. So first of all, I've been impolite. I should have thanked your children for the $400 billion <laughs> that they have to um, pay back <laughs> to enable our clean energy revolution. Um, and the point there is you can't do it all through federal spending. There's gonna have to be a combination of, and there still are remains, like, you know, we're not doing away with regulation. The fuel economy standards, are moving forward. EPA is about to establish fuel economy standards for big trucks. I mean, there's energy efficiency standards. So, I mean, there's going to be a regime of standards. I think the question is, will there be a, a carbon standard or a carbon tax? And I will give you a little bit of optimism because most people think a carbon tax is dead. There are two reasons it's not dead. One is Dave Banks is sneaking one in through the borders. He didn't like me saying that. I'll explain why. The second reason it's not dead is terrible politics to go say to a member of the Congress, <clears throat> we're going to make your energy more expensive, but trust us, like good things are going to happen. The banks are going to help you figure it out. We can't tell you what they are, but like if we make carbon works like good things, it just didn't make the sale. There was a phrase um, that we heard a lot say, don't pick technologies. Right? That's all they want to do. 
this was, we, we allowed the economists to drive our political strategy, which in retrospect is sheer rank insanity. Um, Congress likes to pick technologies. Technologies are awesome. You build a giant new facility in your state that makes batteries. You build a giant new facility that makes clean hydrogen. You have incredible amounts of wind power. Like, they love that. And that gives them a sense of like how this is going to work, like how my state can be part of the solution. So if this IRA is as effective as it must be in building these new shiny, clean, high paying these manufacturing facilities and technologies, then pushing them forward faster has a shot then using a carbon price to kind of accelerate the scaling of those cool, shiny things, we could maybe make that sale in the US Congress. So just give us six years. Hey Dave, I think historically it's fair to say Republicans are not huge fans of standards, environmental standards or emission standards. So where, where do you see this debate coming down? So look, I mean, uh, one of the reasons why the environmental community has shifted towards the regulatory strategy mm -hmm. is because of the failure of us working on or working towards a national consensus in the Congress and in coordination with uh, with the executive branch. Uh, look, I think the regulatory approach uh, is is a bad one. It, 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 it's not it's not an effective way to build a consensus as we move forward. And it's it's not just it's not just uh, it's not just a Democratic EPA, but look, a Repu Republican EPAs. I think to your point, mm -hmm. what you're just you're suggesting, overreach as well by, by trying to gut regulations too much. Whereas again, Democrats overreach and trying to use regulation to drive the policies that we should we we should have coming through the Congress. Uh, and look, I mean, the track record for for regulation driving the policy is is not that. It's not that good when it comes to the courts, right? Uh, we, I mean, whether it's Obama or Trump, um, if you look at if you look at the rules that they that they push forward, a lousy track record when it comes to courts. Now, it does have the effect. It's, it, it does have the effect of sending a signal to industry, mm -hmm. and industry responds uh, because they can't afford to to uh, to assume that the courts are going to knock something down. So they. So they, they start moving in the direction of where the regulation is. But I, I, yeah, I think, I think re regulation is incredibly ineffective when you're talking about how do you solve global climate change, period. Okay. So this is now your, this is your moment. Right. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna a little, my, my wife works at EPA, so I gotta say a little something nice about regulation. <laughs> um, it worked awesomely from like 1970 to 1990. Like the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, I mean, fundamentally changed our quality of life, public health. Once we started squeezing down the public health stuff and started working on climate change, which doesn't have the same immediacy for people, it got harder. And what has happened in the last few regulatory cycles is that it takes these agencies so long to get the regulations done, and there's so much political pressure to whittle them down that they kind of come out and endorse what's already happening. They're not driving tech, like we're not, there's not the political willingness to use regulations as we used to to really drive technology forwards. What it does is it helps kind of level the playing field. So if you have a you know, laggard group of companies in any industry and like the better companies are all up, like regulation can bring everybody up to the same level. So it's playing a good catch up role, but it's not having the same innovation effect that as David says, it once did. But would you say it's fair that there's a role for both of these things? In our I cannot policy? go home without asserting that there is yeah. a role for both of these things. <laughs> and, Stephanie and, Grumet is and not, not going to allow that. Well, <laughs> and I, let me follow that too. With, look, I mean, one of, the, one of the challenges that we have with, with well, you can argue this with, with um, some of the stuff that goes through Congress, but particularly with regulation, it, it, it has the effect, yes, the goal should be to help drive innovation, but it often has the effect of stifling innovation and rewarding first movers with incumbent technologies, right? And so I think that we, that's another flaw of the current approach. Okay. But I do agree, yes, of course. Uh, you know, the 70s, 80s, 90s, yes, we were very successful with, with the Cleaner Act and Clean Water Act. You can come over for dinner still. <laughs> <And, laughs> All right. I promised you guys we were going to turn to audience questions, um, but bef so get them ready. Before we do that, though, I do want to pick up on the thread that we talked about earlier with global competitiveness. 
how does the US sort of carbon policy play into this larger question? So Dave, Dave that, does that's have- your, That's your views. softball, man. You gotta- you, I gotta, you, I gotta you go let you it. an opportunity to explain to You just have to write me in or, or else I'll talk about it for an hour. We'll give you, no, you, you I, I'm giving you six, two minutes, two minutes. <laughs> See, people are already standing up for questions. No, look, I mean, uh, so a lot of people don't realize how efficient the US economy is, right? So if you look at the numbers as far as how much carbon is required to produce the average good, uh, our numbers are much, much, much better than say China, India, and our, and our big, let's say geopolitical competitors. But at the same time, we're in the same ballpark with the EU and Japan and Canada. And you know, it's, this is not a, like, it's not a coincidence that, you know, democracies uh, typically care more about environmental protection and have higher standards and so therefore, and they have more wealth uh, to be able to, to support uh, environmental quality. So it's, it's not, it's, that, that's, not a, that, that's not an accident. Uh, but you know, when, you're looking at, when you're looking at the numbers, and this is where I think what appeals to Republicans is that Republicans will look at the carbon efficiency of the United States and they'll say, why are we not recognized for that? Why is the current trade system structured in a way that supports and rewards poor performers when it comes to the environment and labor. It's just true, it does. Um, and so therefore, should we not think about a way to sort of reset trade policy uh, that will achieve a number of different objectives? And I, I, think, that, I think that for Republicans, you know, they're looking at the, the geopolitical benefits, the supply chain security benefits, you know, creating a market that helps bring. So Dave, talk, just describe the border tax for a sec. I know you don't like to call it a tax, oh, but yes. the, the, the mechanism. The the okay, theme. so yes, yeah, sorry. Well, so yeah, so, if you, so to monetize this, right, in, in order to achieve some of these strategic objectives, you would essentially, you would essentially set a fee or a tax on a good, goods carbon intensity compared to the US. Right, so there are lots of ideas kind of floating around on how to do this, but for example, China is the average product made in China is is roughly at this point it's at least four times more carbon intensive than the average good made in the U.S. So you would take widget X made in China, right, and then you would apply whatever fee you decided on uh, to determine the difference between the carbon intensity of the products. So yeah, so that's your mm -hmm. carbon tax, okay? And if you, if you come up with an agreement or a common approach with a critical mass of countries, right, that are, let's say a G7 plus with Europe, Japan, Canada, uh, and, and perhaps Brazil and a few other countries that are relatively carbon efficient, you create a, cr a critical mass, you create a market where you have at least 50% of global imports and therefore can create a pathway to create a de facto international price on carbon, which I would argue is what we need to sort of drive the acceleration and the deployment of low carbon technologies globally. It's, the, it's a really good idea. It's the most innovative concept that's come into this debate in the last three or four years. So Dave, Dave's, Dave's modest, <laughs> but uh, he's had a big impact. Thank you. All right, folks, who it's has team. questions? We want to know what's on your mind about all of this. There's lots to talk about in the energy <laughs> space. Hey guys, my name is Chase White and I'm a junior. Um, so I recently read that the US built their first major commercial scale offshore wind project. Um, do you see wind energy playing a major role in American energy infrastructure in the future? And what role do you foresee for nuclear energy in the future of clean energy America? Should I take wind and you take nuclear? Fair trade. All right. So offshore wind is a big deal because it's, they're giant and they just generate a ton of power. And they also generate power near the coasts where a lot of people live. As I mentioned before, a lot of the other renewables are in the middle of the country. And so to get them to the people, you need a lot of transmission. Mm -hmm. We're not good at that. We're, we have a very hard time citing what they call linear infrastructure because you got to get 9,000 people to basically agree. So the coasts, the Northeast, California have a huge issue in terms of how they get power. These offshore wind facilities fantastic 
And so huge ambition, it, you know, these are proven technologies in other parts of the world. The administration has put out a very big goal, 30 gigawatts, think about it like you know, 30 nuclear power plants of offshore wind you know, within the next decade. The Northeast states have all made these great commitments. We're having a really tough couple of months. So the price of building new technologies is always higher. It's always harder than anybody wants to think because it takes a long time and stuff comes up. So it takes you know, five, 10 years to build one of these massive offshore wind farms. Four or five years ago, the companies were arranging these agreements and there was an assumption about what the price of the power would be, which the states were counting on. A couple things happened. Inflation. No one ever thought that that would ever happen again. But when you're building an incredibly high capital cost thing, Compounding inflation is incredibly difficult. The price of steel has basically doubled because of the supply chain issues. So the cost of these beautiful machines is going off the rack. And so states are canceling stuff. And yesterday, a really unfortunate, um, Orsted, which is the biggest offshore wind company in the world, based Danish company, had to pull out of a you know, very, very big planned facility off the coast of New Jersey. So it's gonna happen because there's no other way to get the power to the people, but it's, you know, it's bumpier than we all had hoped. How's nuclear going there? Yeah. Well, so it's good and bad. Uh, I, think it's, I, think the, I think the story for the US civil nuclear program is better than what it was say 10 years ago. Uh, and I think, I think that that is a result of innovation in the, in the particularly with, the, with smaller reactors and micro reactor space in the US. Um, when it comes to big reactors, you know, the, the kind that, you know, you can, you know, I don't know where the nearest one is here, but uh, I mean, I'm really skeptical that we will, that we will build them here in the US unless we have a, 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 a huge restructuring of the U.S. electricity market, I don't see that happening. Uh, and look, I mean, there are a number of reasons for that. Uh, it, cost being the, probably the number one reason. Uh, and then, by the way, and, I, and it has <clears throat> the interesting thing about nuclear is that it has a nexus with national security. So, if you're at one, if if you're building nuclear technology, if you're providing nuclear services, uh, and you're exporting those overseas, then you have say over how, uh, how those countries develop their nuclear programs. And I think that's, a, uh, that's an incredibly important uh, point that we should consider when we're thinking about how the US plays in the civil nuclear space, because I mean, as of right now, you're looking at uh, China slash Russia sharing a, a, a monopoly, and I think over the long term, China uh, is in the is in the position to have a monopoly over providing nuclear technology and services globally, and I think the question for the United States: Do we want do we want China to have that kind of influence over the technology? Because whoever has the influence over the technology also has influence over the global nonproliferation regime. Okay, so that's an issue that we have to consider. But look, I mean, I'm actually very uh, optimistic about the micro reactor, the smaller reactor piece not because of power generation, but because of the industrial applications and, and the role that smaller micro reactors can play in the carbonizing industry. So if you have this trade regime that, that we're talking about, right, where US energy intensive manufacturing is, is covered in that, and, and you would cover, obviously, if you're looking at the global, more international regime, it's covering other folks as well. That's going to incentivize investments in micro reactors for industrial applications. Okay, other questions, folks. We see over here. We have in the front. We have. Yeah, oh, I love this. We'll I love be, the. We'll hands. try to be pithy. We have a lot of questions. Yeah, yeah. Hi. So, um, kind of throughout, you've talked about like competition with China is one of the like interesting kind of driving factors um, for our like energy policy, especially on a um, foreign policy perspective. And so I'm wondering, you've talked about like the, the maybe putting some taxes on um, like trades based on carbon emissions and stuff, but what about like with China's Belt and Road product project as a way to like 
really start like monopolizing on earlier parts of the supply chain? Could the US implement a similar policy in like uh, the lithium triangle or in Africa or kind of look on, on trying to monopolize some of the resources earlier? So we are waking up to this problem and you are seeing the US for the first time in meaningful ways, but not nearly as meaningful as what China is doing. Trying to create a you know, critical mineral consortium and bringing seven different companies together, countries together. You know, I think there's a realization that we're not gonna onshore all of this, but we wanna you know, friend shore it or actually have supply chains in a you know, significant um, part of the world where we have positive trusting relationships. So we're getting into the game, but when you wanna do infrastructure really fast, being a dictator is really great. <laughs> Democracy is beautiful, but it's complicated and clumsy. And a lot of, you know, the problem with Oscar Wilde like to say, you know, the problem with communism is too many meetings. Um, so China's just able to, I mean, they are able to build, you know, elevated rail, like, you know, a mile, and it's just, it's a totally, there's no permanent conversation. No one is talking about, you know, the rights of individuals. There's no question about the, you know, judicial standing. There's like, they just do stuff in a way that shouldn't be done and we will never do, but we're never gonna be able to compete with them in the ways that they are spending and modernizing. Other questions over here? Um, so you guys sort of talked about earlier, uh, or at the beginning, nuclear power and carbon sequestration of fossil fuels. Um, and I, I sort of, I understand where you're coming from with sort of the press of time and needing to cover the base load of energy demand. Um, but what do you actually see to be the, the feasibility and effectiveness of these approaches? Uh, to me, like nuclear power has so many other issues that make it seem not worth the investment to start public opposition and then the creation of huge amounts of nuclear waste that then we have to try to figure out how to deal with. Um, and then with carbon sequestration, that's sort of historically been used by fossil fuel companies for greenwashing. Um, and the accuracy like, of calculations for carbon sequestration is widely debated. There's double counting, long-term land transition affecting uh, over the long term what, how much carbon is actually being sequestered. So how do you sort of see um, those impacting the, uh, the usage of these methods and potentially how would you see overcoming those, those issues? So my spidey sense is you're not a fan. <laughs> in short course, and Dave was alluding to this, on nuclear, we're not talking about current nuclear technology. These are small modular reactors. They don't have the same waste issues. They're either going to work and be really, really significant, or they're going to be too expensive and too slow. And jury's out. But like that would provide base load non-carbon power. I don't see us solving the problem without that working, unfortunately. Carbon sequestration, I agree, it's, it's, it's tough. It's messy. Retrofitting anything is always much harder than building new. And if we don't figure it out, we're going to blow through our climate targets because while the US has the money, if we choose to spend it, to actually shift away from fossil fuels, the rest of the world, it's not happening fast enough. And so, you know, I think there are some contributions to decarbonizing the US that is important. And you know, there are places where it's going to work, there are places where it's not going to work. It is not as scalable as wind or solar or nuclear. But it's figuring it out for the rest of the world that I think makes it an imperative. And you know, you raise a lot of questions, but smart people solve tough problems. And I, I agree with that. And look, um, certainly for the US, again, we're not talking about large reactors, but globally, I mean, you're gonna, I mean there's, a, there's a significant you know, increase in deployment of larger light water reactor technologies. Um, and the reason why is because you have, you have uh, emerging economies that have energy intensive manufacturing, but then also they're, they're, they're developing and increasing access to, to energy and trying to drive down cost of energy. You know, once you have that big nuclear plant built, it's expensive, but it's pretty cheap, right? Uh, uh, so I think that, I think that uh, nuclear will certainly play a large role outside the United States in power generation. Uh, it'll probably, again, I, I don't think it'll be built by the U.S., unfortunately. Maybe it'll be, you know, a, a, a group, a group of, of providers where the U.S. may be paired with, 
Korea, Canada, whoever else, but I think it's going to be Chinese and Russian built. Uh, on the uh, CCUS, look, I mean, I don't think CCUS works at all without a de facto international price on carbon. And notice I say de facto, because you'll never get a global agreement on an international price, period, right? But yeah, I mean, it's not, you're not going to have the incentive that you need, uh, particularly with state owned enterprises overseas to invest in that type of expensive technology um, without some type of de facto price on carbon. Hi, I'm Elise. Um, I'm interested in asking about critical minerals, in particular, understanding how China has quite the monopoly right now and has already um, inflicted some restrictions on the US. I know that they like restricted gallium over the summer um, and other important critical minerals to develop um, EVs and renewable technologies. And I was curious on like what can be done to make the critical mineral manufacturing like more domestic and if you think that is worthwhile like investing in or if we should focus more on friend shoring and like kind of just diversifying our critical mineral supply chain overall so just to agree like this is a this is a big problem um we've got to work really hard and it's going to take a decade to probably change it in a meaningful way um what china really controls more than anything is the processing so even though a lot of other countries have critical minerals, in order to turn them into the stuff we need, they got to send them to China. So we have to have, I mean, there's rocks all over the world, right? You know, it, this is not, China does not have unique geology that gives them unique access to copper and lithium and cobalt. Like, it's all over the place. They're willing to mine it in environmentally hazardous ways, to Dave's point, and they process it. So this is, comes back to something Dave talked about, which is about permitting. We need miners for climate change. Like we have to be willing in this country to actually face up to the challenges necessary to achieve what is a you know, species-saving goal, and we're not good at that. You know, we have we're, we're shutting down lithium mines. You know, it's not great. It's hard, right? Like it's yes. There's going to be a conflict between some endangered species and climate change. Climate change is also going to do a real number on all species, right? So like, there's trade-offs. We're not really great at trade-offs in this country, but if we're going to have critical minerals, you, you benefit from having the processing near where you're mining. So if we can actually increase some mining in a way that is far more environmentally protected than it's happening in other places and create some processors, then we will have some domestic, but it's going to require, I mean, this is going to be the usual Northern Canada, Mexico has a lot of opportunities. Um, you know, I think we are talking many more you know, African nations about this than we have in the past. There's some wild stuff out there. There are these nodules on the seafloor near the Cook Islands, which you, you don't mine them, you scoop them. But people are fighting about whether this is OK because you're going to potentially disrupt the undersea world a little bit. And you will a little bit. Um, I don't really want to see a four degree Celsius change in the climate. So I, for one, am willing to make some of those compromises. Um, what's missing is the willingness to even talk about the compromises, which something like the Common Ground Project might be able to pursue. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, I agree with this. And that, that's, it's a really good question. And look, I think we've got to be realistic. China is, what, 40 plus years ahead of us in pursuing this policy. They've been masterful in creating the, the market power that they currently have, but we've just been kind of asleep at the wheel, I suppose. Uh, there's not a whole lot we can do about it uh, in a number of cases. I mean, as Jason pointed out, you know, look, I mean, processing, yes, but we gotta be able to build it, right? Some mining, yes, but it's not as if, it's not as if we have all these critical minerals in the US or our allies have them. And as we, as we know, a, 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 an increasing share of mining resources in sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America are being controlled by the Chinese to be then sent back uh, to China for processing. This is why you have a number of these developing countries that are looking at resource nationalism, which, which I think that we should be somewhat supportive of from a supply chain security perspective, because they want to keep the minerals there and process them there to get that value. We, we offshored a lot of the messy stuff. 
which yes. improved the environmental quality of this country for 20 or 30 years. But now we are suffering the consequences of having given it away. But I want to tell you something, you know, uh, look, we don't have time to catch up. So, and we certainly don't have time to fully address this supply chain security piece um, when we're thinking about the conflict with China, right? I mean, look, I mean, it would take years and years for us to catch up at this point. If we're thinking about it from a very conventional, traditional way, right? Um, but I want to tell you something, the, uh, the tensions with China, they're not going to go away any soon, anytime soon. It's only going to get worse. That's my thinking. That's going to drive innovation in supply and in, in these technologies. So for example, for my, for my history lovers out there, right? What sparked the age of exploration? There was these, you know, countries in Western Europe who didn't have access to these trade routes or were being, their profits were being squeezed by those who control the trade routes to India and China. So what do they do? Seafaring innovation. Right, so that they could they could bypass these choke points in the supply chain. That's exactly what's going to happen when it comes to China. China's invested all of this, all these resources into creating this monopoly position, dominant position. But I'm a firm believer in Western entrepreneurship and our ability to figure out how to leapfrog it, how to circumvent it. So that's my take on that. Time for a couple more questions. So I know we have a lot of interest. So our mic runners will get to you. Dave and I are gonna to try to give 30 second answers. <laughs> Hard for both yeah. of us. Impossible. <laughs> Go ahead and back. Hi, um, I'm Sarah, I'm a senior here. Um, and I was wondering, you talked a lot about the importance of the decarbonization imperative and getting clean energy to um, all Americans. And I was wondering, how do you um, think about the need for a just transition within um, decarbonizing the economy and how, what are the best way, what, and what do you believe are the best ways to do this so that um, no Americans are left behind? It's not a 30 second answer question, <laughs> but a topic that is being thought about a lot. And I'll just give you just a couple of the kind of frames for it. Um, one question is how much community-based involvement is there in all decision-making? My personal view is that is the wrong place to think about the just transition because it just slows down the collective solution. There has to be community involvement, but the idea that we're gonna expand that, I don't think is consistent with those needs. Jobs, 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 right? I mean, what I have not shared with you is in the last you know, 14 months, there've been commitments to invest you know, $400 billion, over 100 new manufacturing facilities, this is an opportunity, right? We don't, we, we have to hire 500,000 to a million people. Sounds great. We don't have any ability, like there's, they don't exist, right? We don't have the workforce. Tra so there's a real opportunity to, I think, bring a much more diverse workforce and engage a lot of disadvantaged communities in the work of the clean energy transition. And so that's a short version of where we're focusing. Cool. Thanks, go ahead. Thank you to the three of you for being here. We, I'm sure we all appreciate it. I do. Um, I was about 14, 15 years old when An Inconvenient Truth came out. Um, I believe uh, it was 2012. Florida was supposed to be underwater. It came. It wasn't. Um, <clears throat> how far back has fear mongering put some people from accepting climate change? Number one. How can we get those people back? Number three. Is there a better way? So Al missed a couple of milestones but Dave you're yeah what are you doing uh, I, mean, I totally agree I mean I, I think that uh, and it was entertaining uh, the, the movie was uh, and it's pre and he was great with the presentation I don't know if you ever had the chance to see him live but you know I gotta say that um, uh, it, yeah I mean I think it caused a lot more harm than good uh, because because it's like um, it's like a prophet you know who's who's telling your future, you know, and if you, you, you know, if you get, if he or she gets something wrong and you obviously notice it, I, th I think it just, it just has the effect of, wow, uh, this person is manipulating us. This person is doing, doing this, to, I don't know, you know, and, and in Al Gore's case, uh, the, the, the hypocrisy with the jets and that mansion and all this stuff. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think it did a lot of damage. Um, and how do you get it back? Look, I mean, I guess I would say um, 
I mean, we're, I mean, we are experiencing climate impacts, period, right? It may not be to the scale uh, that Al Gore was saying is, was, is, or suggesting, uh, but we certainly are, are experiencing climate impacts. And I think it's up to us, well, for, on the Republican side, uh, to, to kind of step forward and kind of and, cha and challenge some of the existing leadership that they need to so that they need to acknowledge it. I'm not so much worried about younger voters. Uh, I've worked with a lot of you know younger Republican and conservative activists on this. Um, they're in a good place, right? They may not they may not know the solutions, but they accept the science. So, I, you know, I think that I think that we're moving forward. More questions in the back? Or up here? And I see one by the poll, which might be our last one. Uh, kind of changing subjects from going on an international level to more local of New York State. I was curious, uh, earlier this year, there was a big uh, budget process for New York State. And one of the big policies that came out was the Build Public Renewables Act. This was supposed to be a huge kind of shift, um, kind of a landmark policy um, for New York to be a uh, role model of kind of taking on uh, climate change and moving to renewable energy sector, while also bringing in the public sector as another more active member uh, alongside private industry uh, to kind of accelerate the transition to renewable energy and making sure we also have equitable just trans transition and making sure energy prices don't explode. Uh, I'm curious to see, one, what your thoughts were about that policy passing within the budget, or more broadly, how the public energy sector can be involved with private industry as well. So I'm not familiar with the precise legislation, but as you've described it, it um, hits the themes of every Democratic governor in the country's climate legislation. And again, I think there's a little bit of you know, we are going to come up with something that, you know, accelerates and diversifies and just transition, follow through. And this is what I think you're alluding to is what really matters. Oftentimes, not unlike the federal government, the legislation doesn't have the resources behind it to actually achieve those goals. Um, on the question of public sector, private sector, I mean, the public sector uses a lot of energy. So one of the smart things that governors and presidents have done is obligate the government to be purchasing the clean energy and also sometimes from you know, new technologies. So I think there's, a, there's an opportunity there. Um, I will not get into the actual innovation decision making between public and private sector because there's one more question. Yeah, I would like to maybe end with uh, this lady over here by the poll. See lady by the poll. Lady by the poll, please. That could be misinterpreted. Okay. Hi there. Um, I've been seeing a lot of dis or agreement here and a lot of nodding along, which is great for obvious reasons. Um, I mean, this is a bipartisan policy center, but I'm not sure that that's necessarily representative of the picture that we're getting from news headlines for spaces not like this. So I'm curious, what do the two of you disagree about? Or I guess a better question is, what do you think is the most fundamental thing that you disagree about with regard to climate policy? It's an awesome question. Wow. Well, I heard disagreement earlier about regulation. Yeah, the role of regulation. regulation. Um, I mean, we could pretend to be on the extreme sides of our respective parties, if that could help. Because I mean, <laughs> we're both, look, we're, you know. The insight from your question is important, which is there's a growing 35, 40% in the middle that is looking at this issue now very similarly. There is exotic, hysterical, vitriolic, angry, crazy on both sides of the edges. And those do tend to be more compelling. They tend to be better sound bites, as you can tell from our presentation, like the nuance isn't a bumper sticker. Um, and that's like a lot of what the battle's about. You know, I think what Dave and I both try to do is um, bring conflict to our you know, own teams. It doesn't, it doesn't matter at all if you have a progressive yelling at you know, Republicans. But when Dave does the hard work of actually, I mean, like getting people to think about this carbon border tax, like it's a lot of work. And similarly, like when I'm able to push back on some of the progressive, you know, we want clean energy, but only in this perfect way and point out that that's, you know, 
So, I mean, I, I can't help it. I mean, that's why you guys are all here, right? Like the, this kind of group needs to be more powerful and less passive and less polite. Yeah, and look, I mean, our, our problem has been, we don't know how to talk about climate change, right? Um, because I think that from the Republican perspective, just in general, right? Especially, you know, older generations, they hear it and they go, okay, you're, you're and you don't have that, you don't even have to say anything but climate change, right? And they'll, and they'll automatically think, okay, you wanna keep fossil fuels in the ground, you wanna regulate my farm dust, you want to, uh, you know, make sure that I can't eat, that I can't uh, uh, eat, eat meat, right? Those kind of issues, right? And I mean, that's just kind of where they automatically go to. And uh, I mean, that it's unfortunate, but so yeah, so what we try to do, we, we try to build uh, or create an approach that so for me in particular, right, for Republicans, try to build an approach for Republicans that gets the results on climate that we need through other means, right? Because from my perspective, look, I mean, yes, I want Republicans to care about climate and to accept science, the science, but at the end of the day, I just want them to do what we need to do in order to, again, uh, pursue the policies needed to reduce emissions. Um, and that's just kind of what we have to work with. And I think, I mean, we have a lot of, even Democrats more on the left, get this well, we should acknowledge that ty and bbc tried to get much more divisive people up here and you got stuck with us but um <laughs> yeah 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 there's plenty of opportunities to find the division in the climate debate if you yeah. just have the google and i think that's a great segue because political division is one aspect of what's been challenging the transition to clean energy the ability of our country to meaningfully address climate change it's not the only one though so i'd like to just a, for in the last couple of minutes that we have here together, just dive in on some of these questions of implementation because we have money now, there's a lot at stake from the bipartisan infrastructure law, from the Inflation Reduction Act. So, you know, Congress did its part, the president signed the law, it's out there, but what's happening on the implementation side? Where are you seeing the major barriers and what should we be doing about it? So the future is very bright and every day is a crisis. Um, Changing the global economy or even the U.S. economy is super hard. Doing it in 27 years is almost unbelievably hard. And, you know, when I said before, like, you know, Democrats aren't great at math, like, that's the problem. It's just the speed and scale that we need to work with is unlike anything else we've done. And we're trying to say that climate change changes everything, except all of the other rules we have in place to do everything else, right? So there's this contradiction between the rhetorical sense that there's a crisis of a problem and then people not bringing that same crisis mentality to the solution. And it's, it's across the board. I mean, you know, the, you got to build a lot of transmission. Nobody wants to see a power line anywhere near their lives. Um, we're going to have to change the way we do that, right? The federal government's going to have to basically say, like, this is where it's going. You know, maybe not quite, but much closer to that. Um, we are dealing with conflicts over, and we've mentioned this, you know, the National Environmental Policy Act, the Endangered Species Act, I mean, important pieces of legislation, but they're over 50 years old. And so this notion that everything has changed, but these statutes must be sacrosanct is just not logical. And so there's gonna, I think it is as much a cultural change as any kind of particular issue, but you know, if I had to say one thing for us, it's transmission. James? Yeah, you know, I, um... I, and, and by the way, I, I think the same thing holds true globally. So, you know, you get stuck in these paradigms, uh, policy paradigms. Um, and I think I would say that they're like from the 1990s or even earlier. And that's, that's certainly true when it comes to international climate policy. I mean, we keep, you know, we keep uh, talking about, so the, the Amazon and tropical rainforest, great example of where, you know, there's clearly been a failure when it comes to protecting the forest uh, from an international perspective, but yet we still keep talking about the same policies. Um, and, I th and I think what's, you know, uh, again, what's needed is a, a new generation of folks, right? To step up and say, look, this is broken. It doesn't work. Let's rethink things, potentially totally overhaul something and reset it, but that's what we need. Um, and you know, as, as we've been discussing, we don't have a tremendous amount of time to do this, 
but we need to think big. We need to be we need to be disruptors, policy disruptors, right? Because again, and political disruptors in the sense that the current system hasn't addressed this problem. And we, we have to kind of figure out together as a community on how to do that. Yeah. I would just say that we have a bigger problem with innovation in democracy than innovation in technology. So crystal ball moment here. What? Looking out over the couple decades we have to reach these ambitious climate goals, talking about a 2050 target or other targets that are out there. But what are some of these wild card moments that either from the perspective of these could be breakthroughs that really change the game for the better, or they could be, you know, additional things that layer on top of some of the maybe unforeseen challenges with the inflation you've already mentioned and, you know, some of the supply chain crunches. What are, what are some of these wild cards that you kind of think about? There was a, a professor in Utah about 20 years ago who said that he had figured out how to do like fusion at ambient temperatures in a jar. And like, I was really psyched about that. It did not work out. Um, but, and Dave said, like the amount of energy and interest and focus, like we're getting good at creating, you know, kind of these hatcheries of technology. And I mean, there, there's, we will find some new stuff. Like we are not gonna solve the problem with the technologies that we know today. The other place where there is, I think, optimism is just the speed with which costs go down. I mean, the costs of the, you know, renewable and wind power, they've gone down by 90% in about 15 years. So, you know, while we may not be, you know, we're going to be inventing some new technology, I think we're also going to be able to make existing technologies, you know, much cheaper. Um, but, you know, boy, I'd love that fusion in a jar thing. Um, <laughs> we, need, we need something. Hmm. And what do I worry about? Yeah. Uh, I worry about coming up with an innovative idea. Let's let, you know, and then it, and then it unfortunately going the wrong way, right? So this trade policy, if we do it the right way, is potentially transformative. If we do it the wrong way, it can, it'll totally undermine international cooperation on climate change. And it will make the world a more dangerous place because you'll have more trade and economic fr uh, friction. So, I mean, we, so we do have to, and this is where process is incredibly important. You know, we need to, we, we need to be responsible and not just throw ideas, you know, on the wall and see what sticks, but we need to figure out, okay, if it does stick, how are we, how are we going to make sure that the policy is, um, sustainable and not you know, sustainable from a political perspective, economic perspective, geopolitical perspective. So that's what I concern myself about. Mm -hmm. And look, I mean, and let's just, let's just be really honest with ourselves too. I mean, if there is a major breakdown in the international security system, if there is a conflict between the United States and China, all this climate stuff is just gonna be Thrown out the well, thrown out the wind on the sense that I, that people, will, folks, will be so absorbed in addressing that that the only climate change pieces that you can be able to get through are those that are also connected with national security and foreign policy. I thought it was really impressive, Dave, that you kind of laid out the it could be profoundly good or profoundly bad. Yeah. So I'm going to give you all Dave's cell phone number, <laughs> and in about eight years, just give him a call. Tell him how you think it's working. <laughs> Yeah, Dave, let's, okay, what are, what are the cases for optimism then from your perspective? Where are we, where in, you know, this transition period now going from, you know, the, the current system we have now to the one of the future, where, where are you most optimistic? Uh, look, I mean, um, I, I think that, I think that humanity has certainly proven its ability to innovate, right, and to overcome huge challenges. I mean, climate is obviously an incredibly huge challenge, uh, but look, I mean, I don't think, not to sound like a pessimist again, uh, but you, you kind of have to fail, you, you, you have to lose sometimes to win and or fail to figure out how to succeed. And look, I mean, I don't, I, I think that we're going to experience more failures when it comes to addressing climate change but the, but the climate impacts that we will see, I think will reach a point where 
it'll force us to succeed and, and, then, and then work to sort of take those back through either direct or capture or whatever. That's my optimism. My optimism, the domestic focus, is that the kind of center of gravity around doing real things to solve the problem is much, much better than it was even three or four years ago. I and mean, we were still having the science fight until you know, President Trump showed up and then it was just wasn't, it was so delightful to have a you know, question the climate science when Obama was there because it just drove him crazy. Once Trump was there, like questioning the climate science, there was, just, there was no juice, right? Was just, there was no fun. The science debate's over. I mean, it's really over. I, it's very hard to find somebody who is proactively pushing against climate change, arguing it doesn't exist. And the solution set is growing, right? The fact that we are in an innovation investment model as opposed to the tax regulation model has shifted the debate. So even though the process of getting here was messy, the kind of thoughtfulness of it and the durability of it, I think is gonna to start to show through, right? Jobs, jobs, jobs happening all across the country. That is gonna change the politics of climate change. And whether people argue that it's because they wanna save the earth or because they just love having all these great, you know, family sustaining middle-class jobs in their states, in states it doesn't really matter. Um, eight times as much investment in clean energy in the last year than any year before. So there's a lot of mojo. Um, and I think you're gonna start to see it become more and more popular because it's gonna have such an economic benefit to the country. Can I modify my answer? Yeah. He's, he's made me more optimistic oh, just good. in the past 30 oh, seconds. Wow. No, no, look, I mean, to, 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 to just really fast to build on that point. Uh, yes, yeah, so if you're looking at US climate policy, we're in a very different situation than we were just a few years ago, because again, you have this nexus between climate, energy, economic, industrial, trade policy that just wasn't there. And that is going to drive a consensus to further decarbonize the US because of all these other benefits that you get from that that are outside of climate. Okay, well. Sleep, sleep well. Because we're out of college, because you said jobs, 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 I do want to ask as our final wrap up here, what are you, like what brings you to work and gets you excited every day and how do we like get all these folks to come join us to work in the energy space? What, what can we say to them about like why working in energy policy is just a great place and that you should definitely come join us because there's a lot to be done. So on the policy side, it's really popular. Right. And partly this is the self-selection because you're here, but I bet half of you would love to get a cool policy job in, you know, the energy and climate sector. Um, what helps a lot are scientists who can speak English and poets who can understand science. Right. One thing that slows down the process is you tend to have different skill sets that don't have a great ability to engage with each other. So if you are a science major, do some public speaking and poetry classes. You know, if you're a humanities major, like gut out chemistry or some other horrible class like that. Um, uh -huh. That will prepare you. And people, like I look for that. When we're looking at hiring people, it's folks who've kind of lived across the science policy space. Mm -hmm. Dave, what are your thoughts? What's exciting about this? Mm -hmm. uh, look, it's a challenge. Uh, uh, and uh, there are a lot of people out there who, are, who look at the current situation and, and just, say, look, we can't do this. There's too much of a partisan divide. You know, we'll never get where we need to go. Um, but that's what makes it incredibly fun and challenging to work on because, because you can make a difference, right? Uh, if you, particularly if you're focused, you know, if you, if you take the right approaches to things, if you get the right attitude, you can make a huge difference in this space. Uh, and that's what, again, that's what makes it so fun and challenging at the same time. All right. Well, please join me in thanking our two speakers for tonight. And I just have a lot of gratitude for being up here with you all today. And thanks again for coming out. We are serious about giving out Dave's cell phone number, so definitely come up here <laughs> afterwards and talk with us. And thank you again for having us at this wonderful event. Thank you.